and let's go to Nuria as our last speaker. So Nuria is a PhD student at, the, at ETH Zurich in, in the Renato Renner's Quantum Information Group. And we will hear about thought experiments on a quantum computer. Okay, thanks a lot, Marcus, for introduction. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, let me put this in a full screen mode. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, a work that we've done recently with, uh, together with Simon Martis, who was a master student at the time, uh, Lydia and Renato. And if you want to look at the paper, we recently put it out on archive. It's also under review currently, and you can access it via just scanning this QR code. And basically, this is a work which proposes um, a software package for running thought experiments on quantum computer particularly like quantum mechanical thought experiments. Uh, and as I guess, like, I don't need much motivation because previous speakers did it for me. Thank, oh, thank you very much. But just to remind you, so we, in science, we often turn to these thought experiments, same as we're discussing in the previous two talks, to explore the theory in question and its limitations. And it's not only done in quantum theory, it's also done in thermodynamics, for example, um, as in, uh, with the Maxwell's demon or twin paradox and special relativity and so on and so on. And as we've seen uh, in quantum mechanics, they're usually used to formulate no-go theorems, uh, which tell us something about how we should interpret um, the theory or interpret, in a case of quantum mechanics, quantum agents in the theory. Uh, but I have to remind that actually these thought experiments, they have not only conceptual value. Uh, okay. So the main, uh, the main characters of these scenarios are agents, and these also can be reasoning agents who are allowed to draw conclusions uh, based on their knowledge. And why we should we care about the settings? Where, imagine like when, forget that we're talking about quantum theory, and imagine just a class, classical setting where we have a network of, of classical computers, uh, which can reason about some calculations that they're doing. And they're thinking about an event, uh, modeling an event, sample, which is happening uh, somewhere else in the framework. And we would like them to reason about this event, um, about the knowledge that they have about this event consistently to be sure that their results do not contradict each other. And let me illustrate with a silly example what I mean by consistently reasoning. Uh, so say that we have three scientists, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and they, after a hard way of work, they come to the bar and they want to order something. And a bartender asks them, does everybody want wine? And they answer this question as in order. So at first, Alice says, I don't know. Then Bob also says, I don't know. And then Charlie says, yes. So the question is, how did Charlie deduce that everybody in this group uh, wants wine? So Char first, Charlie took the perspective of Alice and, and started thinking from her point of view. So if Alice wouldn't have wanted wine, then, sorry. Uh, if Alice wouldn't have wanted wine, then she would have said, no, because not everyone in a group um, would want wine. But she answered, I don't know, which means that she does want um, a glass of wine. Same with the bar. And then Charlie, also wanting to order a wine, says yes. And everybody gets their, their glass. So this is a type of consistent reasoning that we would like to see in a, in a network of agents who are reasoning about their knowledge. Uh, and we would like the same consistency hold for a group of quantum agents or quantum computers. Um, however, this might be, might prove to be complicated. So for example, in the quantum mechanical thought experiment introduced by Daniela Frauhiger and Renato Renna uh, a few years ago, uh, reasoning agents come to a logical contradiction. Basically, what we want is this consistency for a network of quantum agents, and uh, this is this this can be pro 
proven to be difficult because of these thought experiment induced by Renato and Daniela a few years ago, where reasoning agents come to a logical contradiction. And uh, this conclusion was, of course, as any no-go theorem, um, made based on a number of assumptions, which concerned how, mod how agents were modeled, how they made their predictions and inferences, and how these predictions and inferences uh, are, were combined. And in, in our work, we propose a quantum computing package where one can play around with different assumptions about agents, about their modeling, how they combine their statements, uh, which, which kind of interpretation uh, they use, and which different communication protocols that they have. And then basically what the software package would tell you is whether this whole setup of assumptions is consistent or not. And so first I'll talk a bit about, uh, again, an example of reasoning agents, but now more in a, in a spirit of quantum theory. So it will be agents reasoning about their outcomes. And then we'll go into modeling measurements and how we model reasoning when these agents are quantum and also modeled as quantum systems. Then I'll talk a bit about SOPA package, and then I'll present uh, one of the testing examples for this software package, which is the Frau renner thought experiment I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let us go to this more quantum example of reasoning agents. Suppose that we have Alice who comes to work, and her day of work usually consists of uh, measuring a spin R. Uh, this is a half spin system, which is initially uh, prepared in this state. Uh, and based on her outcome, she prepares another uh, half spin system S. Uh, if she gets outcome zero, she prepares it in a state zero. If she gets outcome one, she prepares it in a state plus, which is this state here. And then she sends it to Bob or into his lab, and then she goes home. And then Bob's come, well, Bob comes to, the, to work, and his job is to measure the spin S. Uh, and, but he also wants to know what, what Alice's um, outcome was. Was it zero? Was it one? Uh, but he cannot ask Alice directly because she's already gone home and her job is done. So everything he can do is somehow judge, uh, somehow find out her measurement outcome based on, on his outcome. And suppose that he gets outcome one, then can he say anything definite about uh, Alice's outcome? Well, actually, in this case, he can. He can say with certainty that Alice got outcome one, because if she got, if she would have gotten outcome zero, then she would prepare the system S in the state zero, and he would he wouldn't have measured one while measuring system S. Okay, so this is um, a type of inference uh, that we're looking at. So one agent, based on their outcome, tries to reason about other agents' outcomes. And we only consider the inferences which are, can be made with certainty, uh, meaning, meaning with probability one. Okay, now what we would like to do, we would also like to model Alice and Bob as quantum systems. Uh, or to be more precise, there are several assumptions here in the sense that first, we're allowed to model them as quantum systems, and this is sufficient to calling them an observer. And another is that we, uh, when we say that we model them as quantum systems, we mean that we model the degrees of memory that they use to store their outcomes and their predictions um, as quantum systems. And to do so, we need to see how we would model a measurement in that case. So if a quantum agent uh, measures a system, uh, to which interaction does that correspond? And one simple example from, uh, it's a very old example from Stenkelev experiment uh, is the following. So what do we do? We send uh, a spin, a half spin through a magnetic field. And, uh, and then, then depending on its spin half or, or minus one half, um, it goes upward or downward. But uh, in terms of interaction, what happens is we couple the spin degree of freedom of the particle to its um, 
emotional degree of freedom. Uh, so uh, position Y. And we can do the same in a very simple case where we consider that the, the degree of memory of A, uh, which is sufficient to describe um, her interaction with, with the spin R, and just writing down the result that she gets while measuring the spin R, as a, in this case, we can think about as a qubit um, in the following way. And here I again, uh, for this example, invoke the example of the Obignus friend. Uh, and this was already described by two previous speakers. So I will not go into detail, but in short, uh, as a unitary procedure from Wigner's point of view, uh, this measurement interaction can just be seen as a C0 gate. Uh, and so in, in, this, in this presentation, I will draw the, um, the operational um, sequences as a quantum circuit. So this is a tool which is usually used in, um, in quantum computing and horizontally uh, the, the lines correspond to the systems and vertically, uh, ah, sorry. so vertically we see these lines as different systems and horizontally uh, from, from left to right is the passage of time and the sequence of operations. So in this, in this case of Wigner's friend, when Alice measures system R from Wigner's viewpoint, this, inter this unitary interaction is applied and uh, the joint state of Alice and her system is this. Uh, whereas from Alice's perspective, uh, we, as we have seen, uh, since we assume her to be a valid observer who can indeed observe particular outcomes, a measurement is applied and she either sees zero or one. Okay, so now using, uh, using that example of the measurement interaction, let us come back to, to this example of reasoning agents that I've, I gave before. And uh, now let us model Bob here as a quantum system. And we also will model his reasoning as, uh, as a circuit. So uh, which kind of degrees of freedom uh, Bob needs for this? So first he needs a uh, uh, degree of freedom which would just store his um, perception of the outcome and which gets entangled with the system that he measures. Then he needs two uh, degrees of freedom, which uh, two other degrees of freedom, which he uses to store his inferences. So the first degree of freedom store his sources inference about uh, the case when Alice when he, when he gets outcome zero whether he can say anything uh, definite about Alice's outcome and because he cannot say anything definite this is initialized as zero and the second inference um, inference system corresponds to him getting outcome one and it's initialized in one because uh, if he gets outcome one, he can say with certainty that Alice also got outcome one. And finally, there is a prediction degree of freedom uh, prediction system, which stores his final uh, judgment about Alice's outcome. And then the following procedure um, comes to be. So first, uh, there is an interaction between the measured system and the degree of freedom, which stores um, the information about system S. And then there is a, a prediction update uh, where these dots correspond to uh, systems on which this update is controlled. So if Bob gets outcome zero, uh, so this is a hollow control. So if he gets zero, then uh, if also this inference system is initialized in one, then we apply this update for prediction. And similarly, if Bob gets outcome one and the corresponding inference is initialized in one, then this update on prediction is applied. And this is uh, a simplest reasoning circuit that one can make. Uh, we don't claim that this is optimal, but it does its job in terms of uh, 
showing in terms of showing this uh, necessary degrees of freedom and also um, updating the prediction of an agent. Okay, so now let me talk a bit about software package and how it's structured. So a software package has uh, several elements. Uh, one of them is the agent uh, agent element. And, you, and this is encapsulates basically everything that I explained before, which are um, how agent, how we model uh, the measurement of an agent, how we model the reasoning of an agent, um, and how many degrees of freedom we allocate, and so on. Uh, there is also a logic package, which describes how different predictions from different agents are combined, whether all uh, agents are, are able to use all other agents' predictions, or indeed there are some rules which uh, govern this relative predictions and so on. Uh, then there is an interpretation package, which mainly uh, considers how the predictions are derived. So, for example, this would um, this would this could change the modeling of um, how Bob reaches his conclusion that Alice got outcome one or not, and so on. And finally, there is a protocol uh, package uh, where basically you can write down any communication protocol between any number of the agents and just running this protocol with input uh, from these three other packages will give you the conclusion about this protocol and uh, whether the agents in your protocol come to a contradiction or not. Okay, and to illustrate uh, one of the examples where uh, indeed uh, agents come to a contradictory conclusion under a number of assumptions, let me come back to this first um, example that I mentioned, uh, which was one of the motivations for creating this software package. And this is the Frage Renner thought experiment. And you can you can uh, thinking about Vigna's friend, you can see this experiment as uh, also an, an extended friend, uh, Vigna's friend experiment where uh, you double the Vigna's lab, basically. So you now you have two Vigna's, which we call Ursula and Vigna, and we have two uh, friends, which we call Alice and Bob. And I will tell this a, uh, as a story, which uh, of, a, of a protocol that all these agents um, carry. So first we have um, our agent Alice, who has a system R, and uh, the system R is initialized in the state. And in fact, yeah, the first part of the protocol, we already been through that when we were discussing this easiest, simplest uh, example of Bob reasoning about Alice, but never, nevertheless. So Alice measures the system R in zero one basis and prepares the system S based on her outcome. This we have seen. And this is the intermediate state of systems A, R, and S. Then she sends the system S to Bob, and Bob measures it in zero one basis. And this is the intermediate state of uh, both labs of Alice and Bob. And now we introduce two more agents on the outside, or Orzo and Vigna. And they measure Alice's and Bob's labs, respectively, in, in the spaces, which are we call OK fail bases. And these are basically bell bases uh, for these labs. And based on this scenario, um, one can derive a number of um, predictions that each agent can make based on their outcome. So Bob's prediction, we already have seen. If he gets outcome one, then Alice gets outcome one. Uh, one can derive that Alice's prediction would be that if she gets one, then Vigna gets fail. Uh, Ursula's prediction would be that if she gets okay, then Bob gets one. Uh, and finally, Vigna's statement is not about uh, a prediction, but actually just a post-selection statement saying that we post-select on the round where both Orzo and Vigna get outcomes okay. 
So basically we run this experiment as many times as needed until they both get okay. But if we combine all these four statements, then we come to a contradiction. So indeed, uh, from, u, from u equals okay, it follows b equals one. From b equals one, it follows a equals one. From a equals one, it follows that Wigner got fail. And yet we were able to post select on this round and they both get okay, which means that from Wigner gets okay, which we deduced, oh, sorry, which we post selected, it follows that Wigner got fail. And this is uh, one contradiction that uh, can be derived uh, under a number of assumptions, of course, which, for example, include that, oh, we're always able to uh, glue, each, glue together um, these predictions from different agents, regardless of uh, whether they're being measured in the future or not, uh, that we're, yeah, exactly, we allow, um, in other words, we also allow um, agents to make statements uh, and pass them to different agents, even that even when their notions of Heisenberg cut of their of their or their notions of what is quantum and what is classical do not coincide. Uh, we model agents in a particular way. Uh, we model them as this qubits uh, in the simplest case. We in this package we model their reasoning in this way, and then we come to a contradiction. But one can also think of other logical constraints, one can think about other interpretations uh, and other models for agents, perhaps this is not, uh, this number of degrees of freedom is not enough. And one can also think of other communication protocols to test. And this is seen more as, um, uh, as a playground for testing these different sets of assumptions, uh, which will tell you uh, how they fit together or not. Okay, uh, yes, thank you very much for your attention. And this is a link to a GitHub repository with the, the software package. And uh, this is um, uh, open source and feel free to go and test it. We have uh, Jupyter notebooks which describe how to run different protocols. And we have several, just several examples for interpretations and, uh, uh, and protocols themselves. And this is linked to the paper, which explains the motivation and also gives insight into uh, the modeling uh, intricacies of, of this work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nuria, for this nice talk. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. Um, I wonder, so, so let me ask right away, you've, have you actually run the software package on, on other scenarios? And what would it print out when you run it on Frau Higarena? Would it, let's just say, contradiction in the end? Like... Uh, so basically, yeah, indeed, one of the examples that we have mm -hmm. in the software package on GitHub repository, uh, we have um, the Frau Higarena scenario with the assumption of Neo-Copenhagen interpretation or whatever mm -hmm. you call this interpretation, which you allow subjective Heisenberg cuts. Um, and yeah, logic in a sense that or any any combination of statements is allowed irrespective of the cut. Um, then indeed, it, it just runs the protocol. It it, uh, it prints out the states uh, of the system at different times, and then it tells you, oh, they come to a contradiction. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, could I think of using this for some kind of automatic scenario discovery or so? Something like finding even nicer or more compelling contradictions among agents. Um, just, just um, wondering. I'm, I'm curious what what to do with your software and how to play around with it. That's why I'm asking. So yeah, it's it's a very good question. Uh, it's technically uh, at this point, unfortunately, not yet realized. So now what you can do, you can choose uh, any protocol of your liking. Um, just write it as oh. Alice has system R, she measures system R, um, then sends, prepares system S, sends it to Bob, Bob prepares, measures S, prepares a different system uh, Q, and so on. Um, so you can write a protocol yourself. However, what, you, what it does not allow yet, perhaps that's one of the future um, kind of yeah, possibilities to expand it, is 
to automatically search for all such protocols. Yeah. But indeed, that can be one one direction. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So um, maybe let's open it up a bit also to to Chaslav and even perhaps the uh, the, the online audience um, who would like to begin. Yeah. Chaslav. Yeah. I think I have a follow up question on yours, so I think that's uh, maybe easier to answer immediately. Is that um, uh, when you run your pro uh, program, is this uh, so that um, when to arrive at a contradiction, do I have to compare two circuits, like one which will be the first perspective circuit and the other one which will go through all observers to combine their knowledge? Mm -hmm. But it's really one circuit, and you say it's inconsistent. Did okay. Okay. That's that's a very that's that's a very good question. So in a slide when I was showing the the reasoning circuit, uh, one thing that I was like a bit dishonest about is that, or some one thing that I um, didn't explain is that actually before you run the reasoning <coughs> circuit, you need to uh, somehow initialize the inference qubits or the inference systems. So you already need to know whether oh this inference is correct or incorrect. To decide whether the inferences are correct or incorrect, or what the program does, it just um, chooses a subset of the protocol uh, and runs that, which only includes these two agents in question, and runs it and um, and does a measurement in the end, and then based on that measurement, it derives uh, it derives inferences, essentially. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if there are questions from the online audience. I have, <laughs> okay, I have one question. Maybe let's get to that. So that's actually more about the motivating example. Um, Mark Sandberg writes, "What does the answer I don't know mean when Alice is asked if she wants wine?" <laughs> so, so, ah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I guess I guess like uh, for for the purpose of that example, Alice is a very logical person. So basically, um, her answer of "I don't know" means that um, she does want wine herself, but she doesn't know if everybody else in the group uh, wants wine. Like because Bob and Charlie haven't said anything yet, so she just answers "I don't know" because she only has knowledge about her own state, but not the others. And that's exactly the reason why Charlie is able to say something uh, about the whole group after um, Alice and Bob's answers. Only after Alice and Bob's answers. So, so maybe so I'm not. That, yeah. Yeah. Now maybe that's actually an opportunity to follow up and ask you about your logic module, because maybe mm -hmm. what this question is a bit hinting at is, you know, the answer is not yes or no, but I don't know. So. What, what kind of logical modules can you load into your program? So I can think of modal logic or three-valued logic or kind of diff different ways of reasoning. Um, what, are, what are the options here? Could, could only agents say, I don't know, for example? So, I mean, I don't know is like many valued logics, I think, where, yeah. where it's just a finite set of values, these are um, more or less easy to um, to model in this program because you just choose uh, like a D-level quantum system to model this memory uh, memory state and be done with it. Um, I think what's harder is then to to somehow model the interaction between between these different memories, but I think that can also be figured out. But this um, one can also think of maybe um, adopting some sort of yeah paraconsistent system where. Uh, we allow for some sort of contradictions um, and disallow for the others. Um, or, or basically, maybe even this can be developed to, um, to allow for something that Eric and his student, this possib possibilistic versions of Vignus friend scenarios where they use this um, possibility, um, including logic and so on. But generally, I think I don't know the exact answer to your question because this is this is meant as a playground. So if people are interested in implementing a particular type of logic, there they should feel free to implement it there. Okay. And try it out. Okay. 
good. Um, we have another question from, from Jacques, I guess Jacques Pienaar. Yeah. If multiple Neo Copenhagen observers have inconsistent perspectives, does this mean that if they make bets according to their state assignments, there is a series of bets by which they are guaranteed to lose money? Let, let me reread re this question, in fact. <laughs> so, um, do our speakers see the questions as well in the chat? So maybe you can read it then. No, no, no. no they don't, okay. Mm. Um, let me try to rephrase it. Uh, ah, okay, so suppose you take a Neo-Copenhagen interpretation somehow, um, maybe some Cubist interpretation or so, and you get an inconsistency or a contradiction here. Can you see this as uh, an indication that they would fail in certain betting scenarios, that they would place their bets and then they would be guaranteed to lose money, um, as, as in these sometimes Dutch book arguments are, are called. Have, have you, do you know this? Well, the first question would be if you have given that any thought, but then another question would be whether your, your software would have anything to say about this. Mm. Well, I, yes, I mean, I know about the Dutch book argument. Uh, I haven't given much thought regarding the software. I guess then the betting system should also be modeled as quantum system, but. Um, yeah, like a, a bookie, yeah. a quantum bookie or so, I think would be nice. <laughs> quantum bookie, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this um, seems, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it seems that yeah. the, this, the software wouldn't have directly anything to say about that. So it would be a more, more of an interesting question in general. Um, uh, yes. I mean, the question is here somehow, so because the, the contradiction that happens in, in this scenario is a contradiction um, that happens somehow with the knowledge of the agents. So it's not clear if this contradiction actually happens with physical results that they get in the lab, right? So this is um, kind of, yeah, this, is, this depends, of course, on assumptions that you make. And then I think the, the, uh, the answer to, to the like, money betting question is first, uh, first is, oh, it depends on, on what you're betting money, on contradiction that arises purely in a knowledge chain of agents when we allow uh, for all of these inferences to be combined on, a, on the same ground? Or does it, or is it money betting on actual uh, results that they get in the lab and then um, they all come out of the labs and, com and compare them somehow? Yeah. Yes, yes, I agree this. So this is, yeah, I guess what I want to say as well is like give it back to Jacques and tell it, give it to Jacques as homework for Cubists, no? <laughs> you kind of post your own homework. That's something that I would expect you guys and Chris Fox and so on to have something very, very interesting to say here. Um, yeah, but I'm anyway looking forward to your talk tomorrow. But yeah, let, let me say that for now. Mm -hmm.